This is America Daily, bringing you the best in truthful news updates and in-depth reports happening now. I think we're seeing a lot of this now with some leaders that are stepping in. You know, with the Hopi, you would call them, you know, the trickster type of person, the rare. Often these people in times of crisis, they use chaos to battle chaos, basically. Welcome to America Daily. I'm Jessica Beatty. Have you ever had the kind of boss who inspired you to reach your highest potential? And on the flip side, have you ever had a boss that was mostly concerned about impressing their own boss and they took credit for your work and even used coercion to make you do things? Today, contributor Timothy Gebhardt joins us to talk about what makes a great leader. We'll discuss how a person's core principles affect their approach to leadership, why Crazy Horse was a great leader, and what form leadership takes today. Tim, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. So today we're talking about leadership. And just to start off, uh, what, in your opinion, are the core principles that affect how a person leads or how they follow? Yeah, there's ways of thinking about this subject um, that can dramatically affect the outcome you know, of many issues we're facing today. You know, and we're talking about leadership here. You know, a good leader might be able to navigate these, but uh, but first and foremost, you know, who do we follow? You know, I was thinking about this quite a bit, and um, it kind of gets into again, you know, until it, these these core beliefs. So, for one example, basically, we we can look, you know, the human life. What what is the meaning of the human life? There's the the you know the modernist liberalism would say basically that there's no soul. And, uh, you know, I think that's where, you know, we're talking about leadership and who to follow. Um, at least in my mind, anyways, I think that makes like the biggest difference. Um, I can give some examples, but, uh, you know, with the, the no soul argument that leads people to live their lives in, in kind of different ways. We can see, you know, the general philosophy, but the, the no soul argument and one way that people might live because of that is that, you know, this life is it. There's no soul. So whatever happens, that's it. It's meaningless, you know, this life. So just party, drink, do all that stuff. Because after that, there's nothing. You're just worm food. The sun goes into supernova. All life explodes. Nothing matters after that. So that's one. And then the second one way you live basically if you don't think there's a soul is that life is so meaningful whereas before nothing mattered you can you can also live where it's so meaningful that you want to have fun you know every day matters so much because everything is right here we got this one shot got to make it worth it you know it's this roller coaster ride so you're going to put all your chips into this one life and anything that kind of goes against that, you know, severely interferes uh, with your, the meaning in your life and your happiness and all that stuff. But then again, you know, the interesting thing about this is, well, then you can go to that person and you can make that same argument. Well, in the end, everything goes supernova. Everybody dies. Nothing matters. So in the end, that kind of debunks that too. You know, even if they say, well, but our legacy, you know, that we leave behind well, you can say, well, yeah, everything goes supernova, everything explodes, and that's it. Um, so these are both under, you know, the the no soul liberalism kind of philosophy of life. Um, and then there's another one where you say, well, we do have a soul. Um, and, and that gets into, you know, where we continue on. So not all the emphasis is on this life and what's here. So I think, you know, going back to the what makes a good leader, what makes a good follower. Uh, I, I think the end goal there is really important. And uh, we can see this in many issues, again, you know, with the abortion issue. I think this one spells it out pretty well, but and, and to the end goal. So who would you consider to follow? Um, one example of this would be, you know, as I said, abortion. In the liberal mindset, um, the fetus is just a basically a pile of cells. And <laughs> this is... Uh, Ben Shapiro, he he made this argument. I thought it was really funny, but um, you know he's one of the major pro-life figures we have, and his argument that he made to a lot of people was that are pro-abortion. You know these these twenty-somethings. He 
he gives talks to at colleges and things like that. They'll say, well, the fetus is a pile of cells. And then, you know, he would say, well, fast forward 20 years later, what are you now? <laughs> because there's still just a pile of cells because there's no soul. Um, so could your mom abort you now? You know, obviously not. Um, so, you know, when does the soul enter the body, you know, between the first, second trimester kind of thing. So, it, you know, it gets into all these like, you know, weird moral situations where it's, it's hard to, to make any sense of in those cases. You know, in these trains of thought, you know, when followed um, through to their course, you know, it leads us to this nihilism, despair, and a lot of different hosts of ills. You know, I, I think I got one more example here. Um, and this, this goes into like how you raise your kids, basically, because we can see the difference there too with, you know, a liberal mindset, you know, based on the reasoning that we start out kind of like perfect because what in the end matters most is our, our feelings and, you know, it's basically, you know, our freedom of choice, things like that are most important. So in, in that situation, we're all perfect at the outset. Uh, so a lot of, you know, kids are coddled, parents not strict with them. You know, it's your feelings that matter. The most important thing is to express yourself. And, and that's where, you know, the, the, the emphasis on is to just express yourself. Whereas then, you know, a traditional take on this would be, it takes a lot of work to create a decent civil person. It takes just a tremendous amount of work to make a good person. You know, they're not perfect at the outset. You know, these lovely little angels, it takes a lot of effort to get to that point. So, you know, you go back to the, the classical education where it's logic, rhetoric, grammar, um, you know, make the mind sharp you know, you focus on morality, you know, there, there was, you know, faith in schools and, uh, you know, India is starting to go back to this. Um, they're, they're kind of getting away from the British as secular government, and, you know, praise, replacing it with, you know, the, a more Hindu kind of um, uh, government where, you know, the, where faith is being put back in the schools um, to teach kids, you know, right conduct and uh, morality. And, and that's something people are striving for. So that's just a side note. But um, yeah, so in, in these situations, we can kind of see that the way I kind of understand it is that, you know, what makes a good leader, what makes a good follower is that, uh, well, what's the end goal? Um, and I, I think for, for me personally, I can answer that with somebody that focuses on the spirit, something not on the here and now because uh, we're temporal beings and, you know, our, our, Spirit is what's most important, you know, to to take care of that, um, our character. So when I meet my final end, regardless, you know, I, I'm going to feel proud of who I am and what I stood for and what I did. Uh, so I'm going to follow somebody that takes me there. So that that's what I'm looking for in a, in a leader, basically. Coming up, Crazy Horse and why he was a great leader. So what do you think makes a great leader? Yeah, you know, as I said, you know, it, it's somebody that really kind of understands the human condition and uh, what takes into account, you know, in, at least in, in what, what, how I see it is that somebody that takes care of the spirit. And because uh, there, I mean, the human condition, again, you know, we're very temporal. Um, everything shifts around so much. You know, in the end, we have to ask these deeper questions. 
uh, at some point. Otherwise, the foundation is going to be like uh, we're we're building our lives on sand, and we can shift with the wind any direction. So we need that that concrete you know, sense of morality. And um, I went to a lot of these different leadership seminars in my my twenties. You know, through the Chamber of Commerce, um, I was really interested in, in 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 that topic. You know, to kind of figure out what it was. And, you know, I was just kind of interested in, in that dynamic. Um, and a lot of the business leaders would attend these, these, these uh, conferences and things like that. And uh, so with, with a lot of them, I think they kind of had the same, from the same standpoint, where it's, they, they were looking for that spirit too, because, you know, they're asked, you know, who's your I mean idol in life? You know, and they'd say, they, would, they would say like Jesus Christ or the Dalai Lama or something like that. And, uh, you know, they would, you know, carry that into the community too. You know, it wasn't just words. It wasn't fluff. I mean, where I live, uh, you know, in the Fox Valley in Wisconsin here, they take, you know, a lot of our, you know, infrastructure, you know, our parks, everything like that. I mean, they put, invest a lot into that, you know, so it, it improves the quality of life of everybody that lives here. We all constantly, you know, make the, the list of one of the most, you know, pleasant places to live in the United States you know, that those uh, charts, those lists kind of things. So, um, you know, it speaks to the power of, you know, having those, those kind of leaders or those people that looking up to those people that will give you that, that moral foundation, you know, that stable character, because that, that will affect everything you do and your outlook on life. It will basically kind of give you new eyes to see the world where you can make the right actions and be a good person and and help the community and live this meaningful life where you go to the grave you know with your soul after that where your soul is going to be in better shape than when you entered into this world so you were telling me before that one of the people who really inspired you was crazy horse uh why do you think he was a great leader what's fascinating about that is well, I got to walk through, you know, the Crazy Horse Monument. We had a story about that, you know, a few years ago. And uh, it's this very special place. You know, they don't use any kind of government funds. You know, it's very, like, you know, a very positive place, you know, to show traditional Native American culture, you know, the Crazy Horse Monument itself. You know, it, it's based off kind of Crazy Horse is basically, you know, a central figure in, in many ways. Because you know his his life basically encapsulated that spirit, so that, that's one of the reasons they chose Crazy Horse. But uh, I remember, yeah, reading a, it was a it was a book by Joseph Marshall the third, and this was is a very kind of a like one of those life changing books for me. You know, it was, it's basically about the uh, you know the life of Crazy Horse and and Joseph Marshall the third. He takes a lot of the stories from his great grandparents the great aunts, uncles, things like that, that lived with Crazy Horse. And, and they were talking about his experiences, you know, their experiences with Crazy Horse and who he was as a person. You know, these were all orally passed down from generation to generation. And, uh, you know, I was, I was reading this book and, you know, I was almost brought to tears so many times, but because Crazy Horse, he, he really personified that selflessness. He was extremely spiritual person. And, uh, you know, growing up, you know, he had to face a lot of challenges and, you know, he overcame them with persistence um, that came with spiritual conviction. When he was growing up, he was, you know, he had the, this kind of like brown wavy hair. He had kind of lighter skin. He looked kind of girly. And, you know, the other boys would you know, always taunt him, you know, at a, at a very young age, you know, throughout his childhood. So he would often spend a lot of time alone you know, out in the woods by himself, just reflecting on things. You know, he, he was very introverted. He was very socially awkward. You know, he would barely talk. And, um, but the uh, spiritual leaders, um, they took an interest in him. Eventually, you know, they guided him in what it was called, you know, the path of the Hayoka. It's basically kind of maybe roughly translated as like a, a clown. Um, but the Hioka would do everything differently than 
your your normal person. So, if, for example, when Crazy Horse was out on a raid or something with his fellow warriors, when they get back, it's often you know accustomed to sit around the fire and proclaim your your victories. See, we would boast about your your deeds in battle, and Crazy Horse would be he would be nowhere in sight because in the Hioka, how he was raised, you weren't supposed to boast or anything. You take no credit. Any of the spoils of war, he would just give to the less fortunate. But he, the horses, he would give to you know the, the poor elderly, and he would even before a battle, um, the Battle of Greasy Grass in Fort Kearney. You know he would he would meditate before battle, and a lot of his followers at that time that he had, they were sitting around him like, um, you know, there's a battle over there. Uh, you know, what are you doing? But he would meditate, you know, clear his mind. And he, he that had the supernatural fighting ability. You know, there, there's all these stories about him running through bullets and, and all the bullets missing. You know, he would also, what I thought was really interesting about him, he was very prophetic. He had a lot of visions in life, you know, about his people and also the future. And a lot of those were relayed where he would, you know, see the issues that his people would face. And, um, you know, in the end, one of his visions, he saw a, a shining light. You know, he saw basically the passage of time as on the rocky outcrop he was sitting on. You know, all of a sudden roads, everything would pass by. You know, the passage of time, the landscape would change. You know, all, the, all these white people would basically kind of colonize everything, um, you know, all this modern stuff. And then the, he kind of saw this, like, this darkness, kind of this de- decaying thing. And then all of a sudden a brilliant light came and just, you know, renewed everything. And uh, he also, before his death, he said he would come back to his people in stone and well, here we have the Crazy Horse Monument, and you know he had all these different obstacles he had to go through too. You know, even his own people, in some instances, you know, were against him. You know, um, you know, said through jealousy, things like that. Uh, you know, even at his death, two of his own people braced him as he was st- running the back with a bayonet, and and so we see this remarkable figure emerge from all this and and that that monument is going to be here <laughs> for how long you know it's it's going to be there for probably a million or so years or more given how big it is and just you know the the granite it's carved from just does not weather away so it's going to be there for generation upon generation upon generation you know and and this is a great you know lesson people to learn from you know his life and his life story it's going to be told that long into the future so i just think he's just this remarkable figure coming up leadership today and how not to manage people So in what context do you see leadership playing out today? It's difficult now. I was kind of having trouble, you know, thinking about this topic because I think we have to go again back into what's actually good and bad because I think that line that that line is so blurred now. You know, it's to where we have to kind of 
go back to essentially what was given to us. You know, again, you take like the crazy horse, the legend about the white buffalo woman and how their tradition was relayed. She was like a deity that came. Um, there were two hunters that were out a field uh, looking for game. And you know, they, they came across this cliff. And you know, they're looking down and all of a sudden um, this deity came down. And it was a white buffalo woman. And, and she you know, appeared before them. And, you know, she was radiant, just absolutely beautiful. And one of the warriors wanted to capture her, you know, and poof, she, she turned him into just a pile of worms. And the other one, you know, knelt down respectfully and bowed. And she imparted how the Lakota were supposed to live to this warrior, you know, uh, what the roles of men and women were, you know, how, what dignity looked like you know um you know things like respect honor you know you know not to tell lies you know things like that basically you know how to live how would a lakota is supposed to live you know values virtues everything like that and he went back you know and told his people you know we need to live this way we need to keep these things we look at leaders now um i think what's important now and i think people are maybe seeing this is that we we go back into these more traditions um, you know, that, that were, were given to us, you know, like how to respect others, you know, what's a proper way to live from a higher perspective, not from a, a, a human perspective where it's just a foundation built on sand that shifts any which way that can be manipulated by a person this way or that way. Um, but really like these, these true traditional ways of living. And I, I think we're seeing this all around the world again. And in previous podcasts, we we're talking about Marxism and uh, you know, where that's taking us and people are reacting to that with traditional values again. So uh, I think people are, are starting to pull back from that. But what I think makes a good leader now is somebody that takes us back to those. That's in my opinion anyways, but there it is. Yeah, I've thought a lot about leadership in the workplace and because it in- impacts people quite a lot, you know, their managers or their bosses. And what's interesting to me is that a lot of these managerial positions are filled with narcissists, basically. And there's a lot of articles about this, but, you know, because narcissists can be very charming and they can make themselves look good. So people want to hire them for the job. But the problem with this is that it's not so productive because, a, you know, a great leader is someone who thinks about the needs of others. But for leaders who aren't so great, you know, their main motivation is themselves. So I think that's a big problem. And you can kind of see this in really high stress areas like Silicon Valley is an example of this. There was that Facebook employee who recently committed suicide. Um, Did you hear about that? Uh, I think so, yeah. There's a YouTuber called Tech Lead, and he was explaining how Silicon Valley has created this new form of slavery uh, because of the visa system and the tech industry is hiring these people from, you know, different countries on the H-1B visa. And so these people basically have to do exactly what the managers tell them to do. And then they get burned out really quickly. And, you know, if they don't do what the managers tell them to, they can be fired. And, you know, if they're on the H-1B visa, they only have like 60 days to get someone else to sponsor their visa. Otherwise, they have to go back to their home country. So it's this really difficult situation that they're in. And Tech Lead was saying, because he worked for Facebook, that at least in at Facebook, the managers have charts comparing all the employees against each other. So there's this all this workplace competition and like clickiness and you know, there's an understanding that you have to work on weekends. I mean, they are paid really well, but, you know, (laughs) is it worth it? Um, Because I guess burnout and depression are, uh, you know, big problems in the tech world just across the board, so. Oh, wow. So do you think it's like, um, I heard a lot of people say, you know, it's kind of like a very shallow kind of workplace environment like a lot of it's just about you know maybe image and money um do you see that maybe that's like 
what in the end maybe is what matters that they would push these kind of things yeah i think so and that's the other thing is a lot of these managers it sounds like they were just you know trying to micromanage people and using coercion to make people achieve their goals or something so that's kind of like going back to what you were saying at the very beginning you know what fundamentally motivates people there is some articles out there you know, said what do you leaders use to motivate people and um it's it's either coercion incentive or inspiration that sounds like coercion so tim from your own work experience do you have any favorite bosses oh yeah oh totally um one of my favorite bosses was actually a 23 year old and this is when i was in uh clackamas and um in oregon um i just moved there all i pretty much had was my rusty rusted out buick for less than two thousand dollars um i got there thinking i had a degree but i actually didn't um my bachelor's it's a whole different story but um so i really had like nothing <laughs> and um so i was like i was we're gonna you know gas stations whatever just to keep afloat kind of thing you know my ego was just like punched like daily just like boom because that's really wasn't where i wanted to be at that point in time in my life but yeah and then i i got a job uh delivering pizza and the guy that owned the company was a 23 year old he worked on uh those wind turbines I mean, he did he did electrical for them so he, he made a lot of money so that's how he was able to save up you know and he he wanted to kind of get into a business sunny own so he opened a little pizza place um but what I really liked about him was that he rewarded good behavior. Uh, you know, if you worked hard, you know, you showed up, you know, you had a good attitude, he would give you raises, you know, he would he'd give you that pat on the back, say, hey, good job, you know, we like you. And the, the people that didn't do their job, he basically let go. And that created like a, a good environment. I really enjoyed it. It was just an inspiration to me, you know, that, that young of a person to, you know, really have that much, I guess, wisdom to, to run a company like that. So I thought that was, he was, you know, a really interesting character. Well, Tim, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Today, we talked about how a person's core beliefs, whether the soul exists or not, will fundamentally affect how a person leads or who they are willing to follow. We discussed what qualities made Crazy Horse a great leader, and we discussed why you should not base your leadership approach on Silicon Valley. Do you have any stories of managers who inspired you? And what do you think makes a great leader? You can let us know what you think on our Facebook page at AD Top Story of the Day. Once again, I'm Jessica Beatty. Thanks for listening to America Daily. Take care. news updates and in-depth reports happening now.